Sustainability Month. I'm excited for you to join us today. Our talk today is called Diets for a Healthier Planet. Uh, Coralie and Stephen will be leading us on this, uh, this journey. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting and excited for their talk. Um, just before I get started, let me quickly just go over a few, uh, a few pieces of business. So first, if you want to put your view in side-by-side -side mode, that's going to be the best way for you to view this event. Um, I've also um, enabled the live transcript. So if you prefer to watch that way, you can turn that feature on. Also, we will have questions. Um, you know, please ask questions, put them in the chat. It'll definitely make the Q&A a lot better. I mean, I can ask questions, but they won't be as good as the ones you can come up with. So please do that if you can. And also this is recorded, it'll be on YouTube. Um, so you can check it out later. Um, just be aware that it is recorded. And then you may be here because you want some cool prizes. We have some cool things you can win and you, you get those by collecting code words. So each event, each virtual event will have code words. One code word is one point that you can redeem for a random draw um, entry into our giveaway. And the code words will be written on a PowerPoint slide. They'll be spoken or they'll be in the chat. So just pay attention to that. And at the end of all of the virtual events, our last event is on Wednesday. You have until October 31st to compile all of your code words. And you can get them from watching the recorded events as well if you've missed some. And you put them all in one email and send it to sustainability at tamu.edu. Um, and then you can actually earn up to five points when you watch the events live, one if you watch it on delay. And you, we're also partnering with Maroon Base, so you can, you can double dip, you can get points through Maroon Base. It's just a, it's a, it's an app and you can actually get cast prizes, so you can check out Maroon Base. And if you want the detailed prize rules, you can find them on this web page here. You can just go to our website and kind of look around and you'll see it as well, but that's the direct link. And what are the prizes you might be wondering? So we have some grand prizes. You can choose between a Yeti cooler, or a GoPro Hero 8. So those are some fabulous prizes. And then we'll have runner-up prizes where you can win a Patagonia quarter zip pullover. And just for participating, you can get yourself a water bottle if you collect two code words. If you collect three code words, you can get yourself a vintage Office of Sustainability t-shirt. And if you collect five, you can get both. Um, and so that's just another way that you can, you can get rewarded for that. And these code words, if, these, if you get the five, you have to have them from different um, virtual events. You can't have them all from the same event, just so you're aware. Um, so with that, that's everything that I wanted to go over with you. And now Coralie and Stephen, you're going to take it away and teach us about diets for a healthier planet. Okay, cool. Thank you, Ben. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Is that working? Good. Yes. When you actually um, share, um, go, stop your screen share and then share it again. Right now we're seeing your notes page. Uh, okay. Yeah. Don't share where it says like screen one. Share like that, just the PowerPoint. Share like that. Oh, I see. Okay. Screen one. That work? You're good now. Okay. Cool. I have two screens, so I can't tell which one y'all are seeing or not. So. All right, well, first, we just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today and uh, attending our presentation. Uh, my name is Steven. And my name is Coralie. Um, I apologize in advance for my voice. It's a little shot right now, but I'll do my best throughout the presentation. And today we will be talking about diets for a healthier planet. Uh, more specifically, we will be going into the environmental, environmental impacts of certain diets and also certain protein sources. And more specifically, we will be focusing on land use and also greenhouse gas emissions. So let's get right into it. I think. So we wanted to start off with just some quick stats, just some general information over food production. So about one third of land surface use, about 30% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions and about 80% of deforestation can all be linked back to global food production. And within the US, about 50% of land use, about 80% of fresh water use and about 17% of fossil fuel energy can be uh, linked back to our own food production. It takes about 9 billion livestock to maintain the US meat consumption, which outweighs the human population by about five times over. And this livestock consumes about seven times more grain than what is consumed directly by humans. It takes about six kilograms of plant protein to produce one kilogram of animal protein. 
And Americans consume about twice the recommended serving of protein, which comes out to be 124 kilograms of meat annually per year. So these stats are just to show, you know, how much of an impact global food production and just food production in general has on the environment, just generally, and also how much meat Americans consume. And just on average, about 5 billion people follow a predominantly plant-based diet globally, and about 2 billion people follow a predominantly meat-based diet. And of course, these numbers are constantly changing due to, you know, the increase in population. We're more towards 8 billion people right now, so these numbers will be a little bit different. Um, we also wanted to compare quickly just um, daily diets for the world and also in the United States to show how they differ. So just a few things to point out. We can look at the daily calories in the middle of the charts. The United States consumes about a little bit under 1,000 calories more than the world does for the daily calories. And uh, these calories predominantly come from sugar and fat, while in the world or globally, it comes from grain. And if we just focus for, uh, on grain and sugar and fat categories, we can see they're kind of flipped for the United States and for uh, the world. We can also see that uh, for meat and dairy and eggs in the United States, there's a uh, higher consumption compared to the world and also a lower consumption of produce. So next, Corley will be talking about plant-based diets. So <clears throat> a vegetarian diet is predominantly plant-based and excludes all meat. The included graph shows which countries have the most vegetarians. India has the highest vegetarian population in the world, which can be attributed to the traditional social norms and the cultural and religious traditions that promote vegetarianism. In comparison to the 31 to 42 percent statistics in India, vegetarianism is roughly 5 to 8 percent of the U.S. population. On the other hand, a vegan diet is 100% plant-based and excludes all meat and animal products. It avoids all forms of animal exploitation and cruelty, including clothing and unethical products. Therefore, transitioning to a vegan diet can be viewed as much more than a diet and rather a lifestyle. And the included graph shows where veganism is most popular in the world in 2020 and the United Kingdom has been leading. This is a depiction of the nutritional composition of a vegetarian and vegan diet. As illustrated, both diets are heavily plant-based and the dairy component is strictly for a vegetarian diet. It has similarities to the standard food pyramid, but replaces meat with plant-based alternatives such as tofu. And as you can see, the pyramid still has a wide variety of food options, which is often a misconception of vegetarian and vegan diets. And just a little uh, point, the code word for our presentation is plants, if you all want to write that down real quick. Okay, as shown in the statistics, there is a correlation between vegetarianism and veganism. Both diets tend to be more common among the younger population and then increase again around the age of retirement. In terms of income, there's a commonly held belief that vegans and vegetarians tend to be better off financially, but the numbers show that this is a myth, and the highest population of vegetarians and vegans earn below $30,000 a year. Therefore, a plant-based diet is not limited to those with a higher economic status. And regarding political ideology, liberals have the highest vegetarian and vegan population, and historically it has been long associated with left-wing ideology. Uh, the following two slides have graphs that show the potential to reduce land use and greenhouse gas emissions purely based on dietary habits. And the different scenarios or bars that you can see represents the variation in the diet. So this graph shows the percent of relative change in land demand based on an individual's diet. So as you can see, a vegan diet reduces land use demand by about 50%. And uh, as you're looking at the results, it shows that a change to a vegan or vegetarian diet has the largest potential to reduce the demand for agricultural land, and then that's followed by changing to a healthier diet, and then diets in which meat is partially replaced by plant-based foods. This graph uh, shows the percent of relative change in greenhouse gas emissions based on an individual's diet. And as it shows, completely avoiding all animal-based products, which would be a vegan diet, 
provides the largest potential for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, followed by scenarios of avoiding all meat, which would be a vegetarian diet, then replacing ruminant meat with pork and poultry and eating a healthier diet. And now Stephen will talk about the red and ruminant meat. Sorry. So just a little background about what ruminant meat is. So it comes from a type of uh, herbivore that predominantly grazes on grass um, and they're categorized by their digestive system. So some examples could be cattle, bison, buffalo, uh, antelope, or even deer. So <clears throat> about 82% uh, of global ruminant meat production um, is represented by cattle, uh, which is a major driver for deforestation, especially in places like the Brazilian Amazon. And there's also negative impacts on terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems, such as um, overgrazing or wastewater runoff. And then the social world of meat, um, there are cultural and symbolic meanings behind eating meat. Um, there's various traditions and even holidays that are centered around meat, uh, for example, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And there's also socio, uh, social and economic status that correlate with uh, meat consumption. So it's seen as a symbol of wealth. Uh, people in developed countries and also just wealthier people in general tend to consume higher amounts of meat. And then there's gender differences as well. So men typically consume more meat than women do. And um, now we're just gonna compare different protein sources and their land use. So if we look at this chart down at the bottom, it says protein type and um, has the different categories. And there's three that are um, just beef, uh, extensive, intermediate, and intensive. So uh, extensive beef production would be cattle that are uh, raised predominantly in pastures and have a diet consisting of mainly grass. And then as we move more toward the intensive meat, uh, beef production, uh, this is cattle that's raised in smaller confined spaces and have more of a grain diet. Um, and we can see just uh, comparing the beef, the different type of beef production, the intensive beef production has a much lower land use requirement than extensive beef production due to the lack of, or the need for pastures. And then we can also see that for pork and poultry, they also have a very low land use uh, requirement. This is just due to these animals not needing pastures to be raised in to begin with. Um, but one thing to point out is that pulses actually need more land um, per amount of protein compared to uh, pork and poultry to, uh, to be grown. And then next, uh, we're just going to be comparing the same thing, but for greenhouse gas emissions. So same situation, beef, uh, intensive beef production has a lower greenhouse gas emissions or has lower greenhouse gas emissions than extensive beef production. Uh, pork and poultry also have lower greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but this time pulses and plant-based meat substitutes have the lowest uh, greenhouse gas emissions compared to the animal sources of protein. In the last charts we're going to be looking at are comparing, once again, the world in the United States, but this time it's going to be meat consumption over the years. So these charts uh, consist of data taken from 1961 all the way to 2011. Um, both situations, there has been an increase in meat consumption. But if we look at the categories of the different types of meat on the right side of the graph, we can see that um, in, in both situations, there's different uh, meats that are consumed at a higher amount. So for the world, seafood is the largest uh, source of meat consumed. But in the United States, poultry is the largest source. And then if we look at just specifically beef, we can see that in the United States, beef consumption is much higher compared to uh, the world's beef consumption. And this is in total tons as well. Um, another thing to note is that this increase is due to the uh, development of countries. As people become more wealthy, they demand, demand more meat. And so um, as the world becomes more developed, there's going to be a rise in meat consumption. And next, Crowley will be talking about public opinions. Okay. Uh, when it comes to public opinion, there are dividing opinions about whether eating less meat would be beneficial to the environment. In the research studies that we looked at, it was found that individuals requested more evidence to agree to the statement. And there's also this perception that changing one's own dietary habits will not make a substantial impact. This prompts many not to transition to vegetarianism or veganism, 
or even limit their meat consumption. Lastly, there are also social cultural barriers to reducing meat consumption as touched on in the ruminant and red meat slide. These include cultural and symbolic meanings, social and economic status and gender differences. Therefore, it would be necessary to integrate these into the development of future dietary recommendations. Okay, and then for the proposed solutions, these include technological advancements such as nutritionally optimized commercial feeds, advanced animal husbandry and breeding techniques. These factors would lead to an increase in productivity and hence environmental savings for both emissions and land use. Many sustainable land management technologies and practices are even profitable within three to 10 years. And then it would also be highly beneficial for governments to include agricultural emissions and their climate targets and adopt policies to promote low carbon options to corporations and consumers. And then lastly, the focus of our presentation, a reduced overall meat consumption, which is emphasized by the UN as a major step to fight climate change. And then an example of a sustainable diet would be the planetary diet, which Stephen will talk about. So we just wanted to include this diet as an example of kind of a solution for individuals and even just the world to take part in. Um, I think a lot of times uh, when we're faced with, with environmental issues, we aren't always given solutions or at least viable solutions that people can take part in. So this is a really great example of the planetary health diet. It was coined by a group known as Eat Lancet, which um, was a group of individuals that came together. They have all different backgrounds, some in public policy, nutrition and health, uh, environmental and agricultural sciences, sustainable development, and so on and so forth. So they all brought different perspectives in, in order to make this diet. And this diet was made not only in the, with the planet in mind, but with people in mind as well. So it takes in the health of the planet and the health of people. Um, and if we just break down this diet, um, it consists of about 2,500 calories, so give or take, depending on the person. And if we can remember from the beginning of the presentation, comparing the diets of the world and in the United States, uh, the predominant uh, source of calories came from either grain or from sugar and fat. But in this situation, it comes from fresh produce. And we can also see that whole grains is much smaller, but still uh, consists of a, a majority or a, a large portion uh, of calories. We can also see that added sugar is much lower than in the previous slides. Um, same goes for dairy foods and also animal sources of protein. And plant-based sources of protein is included in here to replace those animal sources of protein. Some few things that are also interesting about this is the diet was made to support around 10 billion people. It also has the chance or the ability to uh, prevent around 11 million premature adult deaths annually. And what's really awesome about it is that it's super flexible. So it can be adapted to different geographies, to different traditions and cultures, and also to different personal preferences. So it can be changed around person to person. Um, so next, we just wanted to talk about some sustainable diet tips that individuals could take in order to help reduce their environmental footprint of the food that they eat. So the first one being to choose healthier options. Uh, typically, when we choose healthy options, it's typically better for the planet as well, just because it consists of more uh, fresh produce, for example, or more plant-based sources of food. Uh, to further go into that, increasing your plants and decreasing your animal consumption kind of goes hand in hand with choosing healthier options and also choosing plants as a source of protein to reduce our overall uh, consumption of animal protein. There's also diversifying our food. So there are hundreds of different edible plants in the world, but we typically only consume a handful. So when we diversify the foods that we eat, we're not only supporting biodiversity and uh, the production of more diverse foods, but we're also consuming more diverse foods. So we can think back to the pyramid for uh, vegan and vegetarian diets and how diverse that uh, food groups or the, the food groups were. So when we want to diversify what we eat, it's not only better for us, but it's better for the planet. Uh, taking not only what you need, not over consuming, not over buying, not overeating, whatever the case may be. Uh, supporting regenerative farming and biodiversity. Um, this one can be kind of tough because not um, we don't always have access to this kind of thing, or maybe we're not aware. It's not so easy to decipher. Uh, but if you do have access to it, if you do recognize and realize, you know, different regenerative farming and biodiversity practices for different products or um, you know agriculture suppliers, it's always great to support them. 
And voting with your plate, so what we consume tells consumers what, or excuse me, what producers what we want. So if we consume more produce, more plant-based uh, foods, producers respond. And the last three, planning meals ahead. This helps to plan healthier meals, to reduce food waste, not buying what we already have or don't need, uh, cooking more at home. So this also helps us to uh, cook more healthy meals, to cook more plant-based meals. We're able to know what actually goes into the meals we're cooking. So it makes us better, uh, allows us to make better decisions. And the last one is probably one of the easier ones is to save our leftovers. Um, you know, we've already put in the time, the energy, and even the money to prepare a meal or to buy a meal. You might as well keep it if you have leftovers because it's, you know, you're saving all that effort and all that energy that you put into it. And you're also saving on food waste. So better for you, better for your wallet, better for the planet. Always good. And one of the last things we're going to be talking about are, um, or is our personal diets and also the key takeaway for our presentation. So I follow a vegetarian diet, therefore my diet mainly consists of plant-based foods and meat alternatives such as falafel or boca burgers. I chose to transition to a vegetarian diet because of environmental impacts and in hopes of reducing my personal carbon footprint. So I don't follow a, um, you know, like a strict um, structured diet like Corley does. I'm not a uh, vegan or vegetarian or anything like that. Um, but I do uh, eliminate certain food groups and also uh, reduce certain foods uh, that I would normally consume for health reasons and also for environmental reasons. Um, so for example, I don't consume dairy. I haven't consumed dairy since um, I think it was my senior year of high school. So it's been a few years now. Um, and that was for health reasons. I also don't consume red meat, more specifically beef. Um, I will say that I do consume pork from time to time, just a couple, you know, a few times a year, but I haven't consumed beef for a number of years now as well. I also don't consume seafood. Um, this doesn't have any health or environmental reasons behind it. I just, it's a personal preference, I guess. Um, but I do regularly consume poultry and eggs. So that is the one animal source of protein or two, I guess you'd say, um, that I do consume on a regular basis. And I also try to incorporate more plant-based meals when possible. Sometimes I switch out my dinners. It's probably the easiest time that I can incorporate plant-based meals. Sometimes I'll have fully vegan or sometimes vegetarian dinners. Um, sometimes our breakfast just depends. Um, but yeah, Corley, if you wanted to go with the key takeaways. Yes, so our main takeaway for this presentation is just to emphasize the importance of a flexitarian diet, which Stephen has tended to do over the past few years, and just taking small but meaningful steps to improving your diet. Yeah, and this, this also includes eating healthier, limiting your meat consumption overall, and transitioning more towards a plant-based diet. So we're not asking or, um, I guess, preaching for, to y'all to, uh, you know, go vegan or vegetarian. It's, it's not for everyone. Um, but small changes do make a big impact, especially if a lot of people do it. So if we think back to all the different, like uh, the meat consumption in the United States, if more people were to reduce their meat consumption overall, that might start going down on the, the percent increase in total tons of meat consumption in the United States, at least. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that, you know, small changes do make a big impact at the end of the day. But I think that's it. Yep, and those are our citations and yeah. Great, All thank right. you all for watching. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Stephen and Coralie. Great job. Um, definitely uh, learned a lot. Oh, and they already have the, the, the next talk, the next talk um, up, so I can jump right into that. So if you want to see our uh, the, the conversation tomorrow, will be about greenwashing. Um, and is that an ethical approach to marketing? Jenna and Savannah will be taking that topic on. So that'll be tomorrow at 11 a.m. So we'll definitely hope to see you all there. Um, and then I, I won't even bother point on my PowerPoint, but if you guys want to be cool like Stephen and Corley, we have internships um, available. It'll be opening on November 8th. Uh, we'll send out campus-wide emails. It'll be on our social media, so you can check that out. Um, so with that, let me just get into the questions. Um, we have a few people asking questions already. Awesome. So I don't have to think of them. Um, I, I did have this, like a, I guess I did have a question I wanted to ask you myself anyways, so I can kick it off with that. Like, is it hard to like, 
switch to being a vegetarian or a vegan or like switching out, you know, switching out a meal or something every week? And, you know, is that, is that hard? Is that getting easier these days? Um, I would say when I first switched, it was easier for me because I really only ate chicken. <laughs> um, but I think the best tip to give someone that's trying to transition to a vegetarian diet or even vegan um, is just start to slowly cut out. I don't know if you want it to be pork first or beef, just not all at once, because sometimes people tend to think it's too overwhelming and then they just give it up. So definitely just gradually go into that. Yeah. Um, and then I guess, what about like options for like, you know, for vegan vegetarian food? Like w- what are the options like, you know, like in terms of like going to the grocery store or going to restaurants, you know, is it fairly easy to find, to find meals that are tasty? Um, I would say so. Um, You just kind of have to look at the alternatives. And it's a lot of vegetables. Um, Just roasting. I love to roast like Brussels sprouts, peppers, and uh, squash. And then um, also for alternatives, tofu is great. I really like falafel wraps. So um, one of the questions was what's my favorite, favorite vegetarian recipe? It's to make a falafel wrap. And then I put uh, spinach, and tomatoes and uh, some, I don't know what the sauce is called, but it's just like cucumber dill sauce. And that's my favorite recipe. <laughs> and then Boca burgers, or even if you like the taste of meat, there's imitations. I don't know if y'all have heard about impossible meat. Um, they're actually expanding their market. So it's not only burgers now, but it's also uh, chicken. You can get stuff that tastes like chicken, bacon, sausage so that's also an option i think a lot of the big um like fast food chains you can like actually get stuff through them now i know burger king you can get an impossible whopper i'm pretty sure mcdonald just signed a contract with beyond meat where they're going to be making their um alternative chicken and stuff like that so um it's becoming very mainstream and i think easier than ever to be able to find options did you have anything you wanted to contribute steven in terms of a recipe Yeah, I had a a good thing to add. So um, one of the hardest things when I cut out dairy was going to restaurants because a lot of restaurants, at least in America, or where I I live, have dairy in almost everything. But over time, what I figured out, and this applies to anything, not just dairy, but even if you went uh, fully vegan, um, if you wanted to, you can just adjust the menu. So if, you know, I don't know what the example would be. If I ordered some pasta dish and I had uh, Parmesan on top, I would just ask not to put the Parmesan on top. Or if it had chicken, I could just, you know, replace it with uh, vegetables. So you can kind of adjust, even if there's no like designated plant-based or vegan or vegetarian item on the menu, you can kind of make changes here and there. And usually people don't have a problem with that. Um, So that's a good tip just to know. Cool. Awesome. All right. We have, we actually have a few more questions here. So we can get, get to all of these. Um, <clears throat> what are your favorite places locally to grocery shop for plant-based protein sources in terms of diversity of options? Um, I go to HEB as well as um, Farm Patch. It's kind of like a little farmer's market and it has a, lot, a wide variety of vegetables that you can choose from. Did you want to add anything, Stephen? I mean, it's, it's kind of tough here um, at home or like when you're in a big metro area, it's a lot easier because you have more options. Um, mm-hmm. Here, I would agree, HEB probably a really good option. I know I sometimes also go to Kroger when I want certain foods that maybe HEB doesn't have, but it's honestly not too difficult if you eat a whole like plant-based diet, meaning you don't eat uh, you know meat substitutes or dairy substitutes, instead you eat whole foods. It's not that bad. Um, you just go to any grocery store, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think HEB and Kroger are both really, we actually have really great grocery stores here locally. And I think they have a lot of options there. I mean, obviously, you don't, you don't have like the Whole Foods or the Trader Joe's that you might find in like, a, you know, a bigger area, which would be ideal. Um, but I think we have a lot of great options. And, you know, someone coming from my perspective, um, I, I, I'm not a vegan or vegetarian currently, but I, I was a, a vegetarian about 10, 12 years ago. And I mostly eat vegan vegetarian now. I'm kind of a flexitarian like Stephen. Um, but 
my options like 10, 12 years ago was very challenging to go out to restaurants, having any decent meat substitutes. And now it, it's like a, it's a total night and day difference. And I think it's only trending in that direction, quite honestly. So I think you'll continue to just have really great options and looking forward to that in the future. Um, and then this is another question. Please explain the difference between organic and regular produce. Is, is it how the plant is grown? Um, I mean, if you guys want, I can answer it or you can answer it. Um, I know uh, organic food uses more like natural fertilizers, while non-organic uses chemical fertilizers. And a lot of people um, tend to say like organic food has more nutrients on the opposite of non-organic food. Organic food also doesn't use pesticides. Yeah. Um, I want to say it also is non-GMO as well. It is. Um, yeah. And there might be a few other regulations that they have in there, but I know those are the, the main ones. Yeah. The main thing is no pesticides, no GMOs. Um, you know, they're typically grown in like a, typically in like a smaller farms. Not always, obviously. We have big corporate farms as well. Um and you can, you know, you can get lots of local options. The Howdy Farm actually grows um, sustainably and organically as well. It's a local um, on-campus actual farm and you can actually buy their produce. So, yeah. And then she, and then she says she's planning to incorporate Meatless Monday to my, my weekly schedule. And I think that's awesome that you're, that you're planning to do that. Um, it's a very easy thing to do. Just replace one meal a week and you might, it really, I think the thing that's so cool is, I know for me when I became, when I ate more vegetarian vegan, I, I ate a lot more different kinds of food. So I really expanded my options. Um, so hopefully everyone has that same experience. And this is a not sponsored. This is just a comment. If you're ever in San Antonio, Earth Burger is a great 100% plant-based burger fast food joint with tasty milkshakes and burgers. Um, so that's just a pointer for everybody. And then someone else said that HEB has great recipes on their website. Um, so and we had one last question. What surprised you most when you researched this topic? You want to go first? I uh, can go first. <laughs> okay. I think mine had to do with the different protein sources. So I wasn't expecting um, pork and poultry to have such a low land use. Well, maybe land use, but greenhouse gas emissions, I wasn't expecting it to be so low compared to uh, beef pro production. I knew that beef uh, does produce a lot of methane, but I didn't know it was that big of a difference. So I didn't know, you know, like for me, for example, I don't eat beef. So I didn't know it would have that big of a difference or that big of an impact switching from beef to plants or even sometimes poultry. So that's what I found really surprising. Orly, before you answer, I put, I just put all the code words in the chat. I'm sorry. I'm like, I was muted myself early. Code words are late, but they're there now. And I, no one jumped, jumped off. So everyone should get them. Sorry, Corley, if you want to answer that now. Oh, no, you're good. Um, I guess I would just say the extent of like the greenhouse gas emissions and land demand in comparison to like red meat, just how much it can decrease. Like for the vegans, it was by 50%, which is a lot more than I imagined it would be. Yeah, I mean, I think what it, it, it shows you is that you can have a really big impact individually. Like, I think people often ask like, what is the most that I can do individually? And honestly, like eating more vegetarian vegan food, like that's one of the most impactful personal choices that you can make in terms of sustainability. Um, obviously, you know, we need corporate action, we need political action, but as individuals, that's one of, if not the most powerful action you can actually take. So I think that's really, you know, it's really empowering to know that we have some ability to make changes just with our own choices. So yeah, and do you guys have anything else that you wanted to wrap up with? Otherwise, I think we've, we've, we've reached our time limit. Oh, I think we covered everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much. Great job. Um, great questions to the audience. Thank you guys for participating. And we hope to see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Take care.